Welcome to Rural Health Pulse. I'm Jim Kinnear, Chief Human Resources Officer at the Indiana Regional Medical Center. In this series, we focus on ideas and stories impacting the health of our region and explore the programs and initiatives designed to improve health care and wellness. This podcast is a collaborative effort of IRMC and Indiana University of Pennsylvania. In this episode, we are speaking with Nick Jacobs, who is a well-regarded healthcare leader. Nick's impressive list of accomplishments include having served as the president and CEO of Wimber Medical Center, and also as the founder and CEO of the Wimber Research Institute. Presently, Nick provides consulting, coaching, and project management services with senior management resources. Our topic in this episode is how to engage a rural population in integrative wellness. It's my pleasure to welcome our guest for this episode, Nick Jacobs. Nick has had a distinguished career in healthcare fields, specifically in rural settings. He served as the president of Winburn Medical Center and also in key leadership roles for Mercy Medical Center and the Connemaw Health System. He was president and founder of the Winburn Research Institute, and he's done much more that we may learn more about today. Welcome, Nick. Thank you. Good to be here. Well, it's, it's great to have you here, and there's so many interesting things in your background and your career. Uh, I know one of those areas is your work around integrative medicine, and would you just share with the audience here a few highlights of some of the work that you've done in that area? I'd like to give you some history into how I discovered it in the first place. So um, I, I was an IUP graduate, and when I graduated from IUP, I became a high school band director, and one day my neighbor asked me to help him move a piece of concrete slab from his um, driveway that had welled up over the winter. And he said, on the count of three, we'll drop it. And he counted to three, and I noticed his foot was still under it. And so I held on. He let go and moved his foot out, and I couldn't straighten up. So they took me to the emergency room, and I had uh, physicians x-raying me, and they gave me muscle relaxants and wanted to put me in traction. But it was right in the middle of marching band football season, and I, I couldn't, and I was in horrible pain. And I was, a day later, I was directing my band, and a friend of mine, another teacher, pulled up and said, get in my car. And I got in his car, and he drove me up the hill in the, the Johnstown area up to Westmont, knocked on the door of this old mansion, and a doctor answered the door in a white coat, took me in, laid me down on the table, took my blood pressure, and said, it looks like your sack rose out yanked on my ankle and I was perfectly fine and I said to him why didn't they know how to do that at the hospital and he said they won't even let me practice at the hospital and he was an osteopath and that was 1972 and so it struck me at that time that everybody wasn't necessarily communicating in the healthcare field and then I had another instance where I went to my dentist and I had the same dentist for 32 years and I said, so how are you doing? He says, I'm doing good. He said, uh, I went to a continuing medical education program this weekend. And I said, what did you learn? He said, for the first time in 32 years, they told us that the head is connected to the body. <laughs> and they told us that uh, we needed to look for patients with inflammatory disease. He said, now, you know, your veterinarian does that with your dog, but we never communicate with the MDs. And so the first patient that came in, I called her doctor, and I said, you know, your patient, my patient here has an extreme inflammatory disease of their gums. And the doctor said, why the heck are you calling me? And so again, it hit me that there's a lack of communication in, in that world. And, and so I, at the age of 49, uh, was hired to be a CEO of a hospital, went in for my physical, ran on a treadmill at 15 degrees height and full speed and jumped off and high-fived the technician and three days later the physician showed up at my home and had never been to my house before. If that ever happens I suggest you hide under your bed and I said why are you here and he said well we had an unusual outcome on your stress test and uh, you need to come in for a heart cath and I said I, I don't want a heart cath. And he said well you need to come in for a heart cath. And so I went in and I had stents put in at age 49. And I, I was pretty upset. You know, I still had kids, at, one in high school and one in college. And I was at, at the height of my career, just, you know, becoming a CEO and didn't want to become a cardiac cripple. 
And one of the more progressive uh, physicians on staff who was from New York suggested that I look into a, um, what would be considered a rebel in those days in the field, a guy by the name of Dr. Dean Ornish. And I got his number and I called him. And he's in Sausalito, California. And he said, well, if you can scrape together $8,000, I can put you through my program. And insurance didn't cover it, so I borrowed money from my retirement plan and flew out to Sausalito, and it, it was an all-star cast. I mean, I, I'm not going to name all the names, but there are names you would recognize. It was all, everybody, I sat at a table one time at lunch, and everybody there had written a book that year, and it was movie stars and, you know, political stars. And, and in that week that I was there, I learned about mindfulness. I learned about meditation. I learned about yoga and stretching and how important it was to maintain balance. And I learned about especially a lot about diet and, and the merits of exercise. And interestingly, by the end of the week, those people who were there who were experiencing chest pains on Sunday were no longer experiencing chest pains by Friday. And he didn't do any surgeries and he didn't give anybody medicine. He didn't do open heart and he didn't do any stents. And I thought, wow, you know, this is pretty powerful stuff. And, and that was the beginning of how do I get this at my hospital? Um, so I asked him if I could bring the Ornish program to my hospital, and he said absolutely not, that uh, he was negotiating with a large corporation in western Pennsylvania and that I couldn't afford to have his program. Turned out the large corporation was Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shield. I don't know what they paid him. Uh, I think it was in the millions. And the president of Highmark at that time was opposed to taking it into hospitals. So I, I got permission from the local churches, and we were running a, an unqualified Ornish program. And, and then there was a turnaround at Highmark, and they said, you know, we'll allow you to become a, a, the first hospital that has the program. And Dean was, he said, you're never going to convince these people in western Pennsylvania that live on kielbasa and meatball sandwiches and you're never going to convince them to be vegetarians and to do integrative medicine and to do all this stuff and i said well they're already doing it dean and so uh, he flew out and we became a model hospital for him nationally ended up speaking all over um, and helping other hospitals bring the program in place but it was amazing to me and, and there were several dynamics to it but i think the biggest dynamic that i observed was that you were paying so much attention to those people uh, and you were giving them alternatives that didn't include surgery or heavy medications and I, I think that you know in my own case you were still aware of your own mortality but you felt good <laughs> you felt better and it was like you were more accepting of the fact that you could have some control over your life again long answer short question well, it was a great answer, and I really enjoyed hearing that story. And, and there's so many things there to follow up on. But in just in particular, when we think about health care today and the challenges, you know, the biggest concern that we always hear about is the rising cost of health care. And it's out of control and how it's affecting and really a risk to our national economy. And as you're sharing some of those examples, there's so many things that can be done that are simple solutions, that are low-cost solutions that can prevent a great deal of that cost and that expense of health care. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the challenges, I'm not going to, again, I'm not going to mention any names, but one of the challenges is that it really caught on at my hospital. We became the only completely integrative hospital in the United States at that time. Uh, we, and it, it, and it, it took me, it was little by little by little I was able to introduce these things. But I started out by giving massages to the physicians. <laughs> And once they became addicted to the massages, it was easier then to introduce them to the patients. And, and, you know, I think one of the things I have to emphasize is that we put together a, a uh, credentialing committee for integrative medicine. So it wasn't just pulling people off the street that said they had a massage license. I mean, we, we were very careful about the people that we hired, and they were highly certified and qualified and licensed. But... Uh, you know, I learned throughout this process that the average physician at those days, I have no idea what it's like now, only got about an hour or two of dietary classes. You know, they didn't know about diet. And, and you know, it, it's like it, when you look at the pharmaceutical industry, 
you know, a lot of them, when they graduated, they were dealing with 800 drugs or 1,000 drugs, and then all of a sudden there were 8,000 drugs or 10,000 drugs. And, you know, they were reading up all the papers, but now there were a million papers a year to read. I mean, everything had grown exponentially, and they couldn't possibly keep up with all of it, and they couldn't possibly know all of it. And on top of that, there was that whole piece of, if you don't understand it, a lot of times you poo-poo it and... and uh, the other thing I found was that you know, most physicians died before their patients and because their lifestyles were so demanding. And, and so they couldn't envision themselves being able to be, for example, a vegetarian or being able to you know, do uh, you know, meditation in the morning and the evening or doing any of the things that help these heart patients get their lives back. And so they would, they would say, no, it doesn't work, and they'd put them on the Atkins diet and tell them to go eat bacon. You know, and so it, it was a, it was um, psychological warfare in that sense for me because I was the CEO. I was dependent upon all these physicians. I remember my brother asking me, he was a college teacher, and he asked me how my life was different from a college professor. And I said, well, at least in those days, all of my doctors could have just taken their students and gone somewhere else. You know, it's like they could have taken their patients and gone to any other hospital. And I was in an area where there were four hospitals within seven miles of each other. And so, uh, so it was a challenge. But one of the things that, you know, became apparent to me was that once people were introduced to these alternatives, I realized that this was what, what, what prevention and wellness was all about. And even when Obama was able to get his program through, he had to compromise with the pharmaceutical industry and the insurance industry to get it through. And only 5% of it was going to prevention and wellness. And I, and I remember very distinctly the conversation where one of the doctors who worked at my hospital and another hospital in the area went to his CEO and said, I want to introduce this stuff at our place and the CEO looked at him and said, we're in the sickness business. We're not in the wellness business. And, and you know, there's that almost schizophrenic existence as a hospital CEO where twice a month at least you have to make payroll for hundreds and hundreds of people. And, and you're an economic driver for your community and you're an economic driver for the region. And, and the other side of that is, though, you – you don't want to have all this money wastefully spent in ways that could have been prevented. And so I think we found a happy medium where we were offering wellness prevention. You know, the first thing I, I built was a wellness facility. And, and all of our employees got you know, re greatly reduced rates to belong to it. And, and so we looked at our employees first as a way to introduce integrative medicine. And we did it through hiring a, a dietary company that brought in chefs instead of just, you know, short order cooks. And they were able to prepare low fat meals. We were able to get the local vending companies to put things in the machine other than just, you know, high fructose uh, sugars and candies and, and sodas. And we served alternative meals. And then we cooked those meals and prepared them so people could buy them and take them home at night, because if they didn't have time to prepare at night. Um, but then layer by layer by layer by layer over the next several years, I added different components of integrative medicine. I had at one point in my career been the president of the Convention and Visitors Bureau at Laurel Highlands, and I was walking into an Eaton Park restaurant with the director of marketing, and I said, this place smells great. It was bread. They could smell bread. And he said, you think this is an accident? We pipe that smell in here. It releases endorphins. And so I thought, you know what? Why don't I do this at the hospital? So I bought bread baking machines and put them all through the hospital. Now, if you were there for a GI procedure, that wasn't necessarily the mo most wonderful thing because you couldn't eat the bread. But, but it, 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 you know, it reminded you of your grandmother, your aunt. It reminded you of wonderful things, and it made you feel better. We entered, um, as a musician, I have a master's in music along with my master's in hospital administration, it allowed me to bring musicians in. We had a string quartet in residence. We had roving guitar players. We had piano players. We had people in the hospital that could bring peacefulness and mindfulness and happiness to the, 
uh, pet therapy was huge. We had you know the golden retrievers, the golden girls, um, all again highly regulated and and certified and trained. Um, but I think the one thing that allowed me to do this was that in 1990, 1977, long, long, long before I was there, 20 years before I was there, um, this hospital, Winber, had the first rural hospice. And what I saw when I went there was that when they went to hospice, the reality of your mortality was finite. And so the rules there were completely different than they were in the rest of the hospital. And for the life of me, I couldn't understand why you had to be dying to experience that kind of nurturing, caring, loving environment. And, and so that became my passion. And so we began introducing all of the elements that would make it a healing environment. We, we, we had, I introduced 24-hour visiting, which when I, when I introduced that, you would have thought I asked all of the employees to bring in their firstborn child to be executed. I mean, it was not a popular choice on my part, but we found that, you know, you, you had a couple that were married for 55 years, and I made sure that there was a, a bed in the room for the loved one, not a hospital bed, a regular, it was a Murphy bed, and the nurse would come in and say, well, your, hus your husband's been coughing for the last hour, I'm going to give him this medicine. And she said, no, no, turn him on his left side. He doesn't cough when he sleeps on his left side. So they became part of the healing environment. And we put double beds in the OB suites. We put in, uh, you know, massage, aromatherapy. All those things uh, contributed to what I believe made a healing environment through integrative medicine. Well, that was great hearing those examples. And just as you're speaking, this vision of this flourishing program of offering these options to people and how holistic it is and really you know, treating the whole person. Do you think healthcare today still is, has some barriers and skepticism? Oh, totally, 100%. Yeah, one, you know, health, healthcare, all of healthcare was based on military care. I mean, it was like, you know, get the soldiers back into battle. And and it, so, so much of, I mean, look at the way the doctors are trained. I, it's it's hard to meet a doctor that hasn't in some way been psychologically or spiritually wounded by the training programs they go through. I mean, they're attacked, they're blamed, they're picked on, they have to, you know, work 24 hours. It's just, it's an unbelievable setting that's a military-based setting. And uh, anything that, you know, is deemed to be, it, you know, this is feminine energy we're talking about here. And, you know, there's that whole macho piece, too. It's like, um, you know, they call it woo-woo medicine. This is woo-woo medicine. Well, you know, for some people, it makes all the difference in the world. I mean, when my brother was hospitalized for 95 days, on the days that the pets, the pets were allowed to visit, it changed his world. When the music therapist sat beside him and played you know, hymns from when he was a little child, it changed his world. And Because that, that mind is connected to the body. And... and you know, we separate that. And, and, and the other thing is hospitals are really intimidating, scary places, and they're noisy places. And, you know, what they say for every day you're in a hospital, you need a couple of weeks to get, out, you know, to get better after you get out. It, it's not a, a not a relaxing, warm uh, environment, typically. And even though, you know, I'm, I'm talking pre-COVID here, obviously, all of this has been just such an incredible challenge. I mean, I'm not going to get into what COVID did to us, but I think the thing that it did more than anything was to point out the complete vulnerability of our population as a country uh, because of you know issues like obesity and other issues that we're not dealing with when it comes to wellness and prevention. So my integrative story is what I ended up taking across the United States. And I worked at uh, Cedar sinai I worked at Hackensack Meridian, I worked at Atlantic Health, I worked in um, a Parkview Health System in Fort Wayne. I was in Chicago. I was in Naples, Florida. I was trying to take this message across the country. And interestingly enough, I was adopted as the only non-physician by the American Board of Integrative Holistic Medicine. And then we founded the Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine. And there are thousands now of doctors getting educated in functional medicine, getting educated in integrative medicine, and getting certified, not unlike an OBGYN or an oncologist in integrative medicine. It just 
is more common in places like urban areas uh, like California, like L.A., you know, San Diego, New York, Naples, places, money places, too. I'm curious in this time period, how has medical education and residency programs changed? Are they including more information about integrative medicine and nutrition in some of these areas, or is it still an opportunity? Yeah, there were a few places that embraced it. I mean, there, there, I think, and again, I'm out of touch with this figure, but I think it was 52 academic medical centers have some form of integrative medicine. The Cleveland Clinic was very involved. Duke was very involved. Uh, they had programs in integrative medicine. Um, um, you know, the one that I did at Atlantic Health was just a phenomenal program out there. And, and interestingly enough, that was driven by the cardiac physicians because they found that when they did a cardiac surgery, if the patient was exposed to music and mindfulness and you know, the other healing therapies, they got out earlier so they could do more patients. It was an economic value to them. They were able to turn the beds over faster in a, in a positive way with people living, you know, healthier post-surgery lives. That's the other thing. You know, I, I brag about this. I, you, you can't prove it, so you know you won't know if this, these facts are accurate. But when I was still the CEO, this is not 2008 into nine, we looked at all of the, our peer hospitals. There were 13 peer hospitals our size, we had the lowest infection rate. Our infection rate dropped to 1%. The Joint Commission couldn't believe it. The Pennsylvania Department of Health couldn't believe it. They thought we were fudging numbers. But we had the lowest infection rate. We had the lowest restraint rates. We had the lowest readmission rates. And, you know, we had the lowest lawsuit rates. It was just, you know, economically... It, it, if if CFOs believed in when someone said I can save you money, if they believed that, uh, you could see where all of the savings came in into play by offering an environment that was a healing, loving, caring, comforting environment. We had a SWAT team of made up of a, a, a preacher or a priest, and we had a, the social worker, a psychologist. So if there was like we had one week, we had like three young patients that died in hospice, kids. And, you know, the staff was a basket. They were a wreck over this. So we had a SWAT team that dealt with our staff. That We had an offstage room where staff could go just to unwind and get away from it. And, you know, so it was, it was a, a holistic approach to not only the patients but also to the staff and to the physicians. That was the, that was the plan. And then I fell into science. And that's the other thing we're going to talk about today, too. So I can give you some real interesting uh, co cohabitation uh, comments about that. <laughs> Integrative wellness is a critical aspect of population health, and rural areas can successfully engage their community in preventive strategies to help prevent chronic disease and to reduce the overall health care burden. Look for more insights from Nick Jacobs in an upcoming episode of Rural Health Pulse. Rural Health Pulse is a collaborative effort of the Indiana Regional Medical Center, Indiana University of Pennsylvania, and the Indiana community. It is produced by Chris Korn from IUP's Division of University Advancement and recorded by the IUP Communications Media. I'm Jim Kinnear. Thank you for listening, and be sure to watch for future episodes of Rural Health Pulse.